Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Simon Tolson, the senior partner of Fennec Elliott, and I am uh, very glad to be uh, welcoming about 700 or so of you. So it's, I'm delighted we've got so many uh, joining us. Um, our uh, topic for this seminar is, as you'll see on the slide, lifting the fog on provisional sums. And I have to say that I think a lot of us will agree that there's a certain mystique uh, in relation to uh, provisional sums, uh, what they are, how they work, and where they can lead to, and that depends really on whether you're acting for the employer or, or the contractor. It's a common problem for different reasons. Uh, provisional sums are perceived as difficult to manage, uh, to understand, and to execute, and you'll be hearing some reasons about why that arises, uh, and maybe even only to include them as a last resort is a couple of comments that we've received from people who've fired questions in already. Um, and provisional sums, I think a lot of you will agree, are generally the domain of quantity surveyors rather than lawyers, but we know they can have a significant legal effect uh, on contracts. And so um, lawyers as a profession get involved with them uh, from time to time. So we thought, what better idea than to devote an entire webinar to the subject of provisional sums? Um, so I'm delighted uh, that we can uh, virtually, of course, uh, welcome uh, our guest speaker today, which is who is Mark Hackett, a leading chartered quantity surveyor, a leading quantum expert that many of you will know, and principal of Mark Hackett Associates. And in relation to the legal side of things, uh, my partner Lucinda Robinson will be uh, contributing equally on, on this webinar. Now, the, the topics that we're going to be covering um, and we'll probably have a slide um, indicating those, are basically some fundamentals like what is a provisional sum, what's the difference between a defined and undefined provisional sum, and the nuances around that. Um, we're going to be dealing with the valuation of provisional sums because that's a very contentious area. Um, and we'll also touch on provisional sums outside of the JCT family where we come across them most often as well as dealing with um, the really question about dissatisfaction with the outcome of the process, which again happens more often than perhaps it should, and then we'll deal with some, some Q&A. So that's really the, the kind of substance of, of this webinar. So if we can move on to the next slide. Yeah, and of course, thank you, Simon. So we're going to start at the beginning with the trouble with provisional sums. And the trouble really does start right at the very beginning, because even when we talk about provisional sums as a concept, there isn't a formal definition of exactly what they are. So there is a general understanding, and the general understanding is that a provisional sum is a best guess number inserted into a bill of quantities or contract sum analysis to cover an item of work that is not adequately defined when the contract is signed. The item may or may not be instructed at all. If it is instructed, neither party is held to the original price. Instead, if the sum is instructed, that original price will be omitted and replaced with the actual price. If it is not instructed, then the price should be omitted altogether. So the classic definition, although it's not formal in any way, comes from the case of Midland Expressway and Carillion, where the judge grappled with these things and said that in his view, provisional sums are used in pricing construction contracts to refer either to work which is truly provisional in the sense that it may or may not be carried out at all, or to work whose content is undefined so that the parties decide not to try to price it accurately when they enter into their contract. A provisional sum is usually included as a round figure guess. Of course, in practice, we don't call it a guess, do we? We use terms that sound much more clever, like forecast or estimate. But the fact remains that at the time of the contract, no one really knows how much, if anything, the provisional sum is going to cost. Which takes me on to this next slide and the next issue with provisional sums that creates this fog we were talking about with the name of our presentation. So this trouble is that provisional sums are uncertain and this plays out in a number of different respects. So working around the diagram you can see on the slides from the top, let's start with time. 
So the first question we have to ask when looking at a provisional sum and trying to make sense of it is whether or not it is defined. If it's not defined, then it's undefined. And it's important to know which one it is because that helps determine if the contractor is deemed to have accounted for the provisional sum in its program and preliminaries or not. So the question of who takes the risk of time depends on the nature of the provisional sum. In short, defined sums are deemed included in programme and preliminaries, so are at the contractor's risk in a sense, and with undefined provisional sums, they are not included in the programme or preliminaries at the outset. But this is a little bit complicated and Mark is going to talk about it in a little more detail shortly. Moving around this slide, we get to price. So this is the next area of uncertainty. And provisional sums are, as the name suggests, provisional. If the, if the item is instructed, then once the actual amount is known, the price will go up at the employer's risk or it might come down at the contractor's risk. The more provisional sums there are, the more change there is going to be in relation to the ultimate price. So the greater degree of uncertainty and the final contract price could be significantly different to what was expected at the outset. On this slide under price, you'll see I've flagged up a case called Plymouth and Architectural Structures. And in this case, the, the matter at stake really was a professional negligence of the architects, and they had failed to control costs on the redevelopment of a retail premises. They had advised on the procurement process and the contract for letting of the works to the contractor, and within that contract, 87% of the contract price was made up of undefined provisional sums. Now, it became absolutely impossible to tell if alleged variations that came up over the course of the works were in fact variations because there was no real benchmark. So much of the contract was uncertain, undefined, provisional that there was no clear way of telling whether alleged variations were actually extra or different to what had originally been intended. There just wasn't a benchmark. In the end, the court found that the alleged variations were not variations and there was a massive overspend on the project. And if you would like a really good read on how to get provisional sums wrong, then I would recommend you take a look at that contract. It's a classic Next. case. So what is a provisional sum? Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't catch what you said. No, 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 don't, don't worry, you carry on. Oh, we seem to have slipped forward on the slide slightly. Can I just jump back a little bit? Bear with me. Is it going to let me go back? Yeah, we've skipped on. We're still on this one, I'm afraid. And the next point to talk about is valuation. So, Exactly how the price will change needs to be spelled out precisely in the contract because otherwise it's not going to be clear how you deal with it. Now there may be valuation rules in the contract but they can rely on there being detail in the bill of quantities or the contract sum analysis and sometimes we find that actually there isn't enough detail in those documents to make the valuation rules work as well as they might or even um, to, to work at all, really. So Mark will enlighten us a little bit more on valuation shortly, but it's worth making a point here when we're talking about what the uncertainties are, that it is really important to spell out even the very basic mechanics of how your provisional sums should be dealt with. So again, we've got another case to illustrate the point. This one is Midland Expressway and Carillion. Now here, the issue was about this seemingly basic principle that if the provisional sum is instructed the old figure should go out and the new figure should come in but actually that wasn't clear from the terms of this particular contract and Carillion argued that actually the contract didn't include any words that said the original price should come out and that as a result Carillion should get both the provisional sum amount and the actual cost of the work that it was going or that it carried out. Now, at first instance, Mr. Justice Jackson rejected that argument and he found that provisional sums should be deducted from the contract price and replaced with the actual cost. And Carillion appealed that on the basis that there was no express requirement for this deduction. And although they accepted this had a surprising feel, um, the, the fact of the, of, the, of the words in the contract did not allow for this deduction. 
the court of appeal the court of appeal described this surprising feel as an elegant understatement and went on to uphold justice jackson it found that the term provisional in its own right suggests that the parties expect the sum to be adjusted and Carillion's interpretation offended that expectation. Furthermore, provisional sums are only payable at all and if to the extent that the employer so instructs. There is no underlying right to the provisional sum if the item isn't pulled off. It said, the provisional sum is included mathematically in the original contract price, but the parties do not expect the initial round figure to be paid without adjustment. The contract usually provides expressly how it is to be dealt with, and a common clause in substance provides for the provisional sum to be omitted and appropriate valuation of the work actually carried out to be substituted for it. And it went on to find, along, it, it, in agreement with Justice Jackson, that Carillion should not be paid twice. Now, this issue of omissions takes us nicely on to the final point on this slide, which is about omissions. Now, if a provisional sum is included in the contract, it becomes part of the overall scope of works, whether it's defined or undefined. And that means the contractor has both the right and the obligation to carry them out if instructed. Now, the employer can decide not to instruct the provisional sum at all. That's absolutely fine. But he's not free to take them off the contractor and give them to another contractor. If he were to do that, that would entitle the original contractor to claim for the loss of profit on that provisional sum item. Now, this matter was dealt with in AMEC and Cadmus, and it was an appeal from an arbitration in this particular situation. Now, Cadmus had sought to omit provisional sum work relating to a food court and give it to another contractor to do the work at a cheap rate. And the question was, was Cadmus entitled to do it? And the court held that no, it wasn't, actually. It wasn't allowed to take the work off and give it to somebody else and AMEC was entitled to recover its loss of profit on that element of the works. Now that is consistent with what we have as a general understanding these days that work cannot be omitted and just given to another party, absent clear words in the contract and probably a contribution to lost profit. And the go-to case on that for omissions generally is Abbey Development. Now, having set out all of these problems with provisional sums, what are we going to do about them? Well, I am going to hand over to Mark, who is going to tell us exactly what we need to do with them. Aren't you, Mark? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> well, in answer to the uh, question, uh, what is a provisional sum? I mean, it is essentially um, what, what it is described as within the meaning of the particular contract un under application. Some contracts uh, codify it and some don't. You obviously have a codified contract. You have the basic advantage that the that the rules surrounding the status of the provisional sum and the manner of its adjustment uh, are set out, and, and that's to be commended. But in literal terms, I suppose if you just take the word provisional sum, it is a provision in the sense that a budget is created. It is also provisional in the sense that it is an amount uh, subject to late, later alteration, as Lucinda alluded to in in the earlier case law points where. Um, the judges uh, recognised that it was a sum that wasn't intended to be precise, was an amount, and it was an amount that would be supplanted in due course by the uh, properly established figure due. So you then ask yourself the question, a provisional sum, is it codified or ad hoc? Well, I'll be looking more at the codified side, side of things, and that's by reference to the uh, JCT 2016 edition with quantity standard building contract. Um, purely because it is so well codified, it provides a benchmark against which better to understand uh, the sorts of departures that arise under um, other contracts. And it's also to be understood that the definition of the provisional sum is contained within the RICS's new rules of uh, measurement. So that's, many people will remember uh, good old SMM7, which was with us for many years, but now we have NRM, in three volumes, but it's the second volume, NRM2, which is uh, relevant to um, SBC. So in, in the JCT contract, it says the provisional sum is a sum provided for work within the meaning of the measurement rules. Therefore, by reference out of the contract and into NRM, you find all that you need to know about uh, what the provisional sum is and, and its status. 
Importantly, and again, going back to one of uh, Lucinda's points about saying, well, is this work part of the contract? Well, it very much is because the provisional sum is inserted in the contract built and then, and then it becomes a um, component part uh, of, of the contract sum. And is that a problem? Is there a problem in relation to that that you see that, that commonly arises in projects? Um, it, it is a problem um, because the very fact that you have um, a provisional sum would suggest that you do not know enough about the definition of the work which is about to be performed, which means there's uncertainty. And whenever a contractor hasn't got clear guidance as to the work to be performed around which he can structure his um, procurement and planning, um, then there will be an impact on otherwise smooth operations. And they're operations which could become even more compounded in the event of. Um, a late instruction, not that they ever happen, of course. But what I would say is that is that when you're looking at a provisional sum, there's almost a mystique around them. That some people think the fact that they put them in and flagged up an intention to spend a sum of money under a certain heading is some kind of um, armored jacket of protection to the employer, which it isn't. Uh, in a sense, um, the an instruction given in relation to the expenditure of the provisional sum is no different really to an instruction to vary the works because what you're saying is we haven't nailed down the precise scope and quality and description of the work in accordance with NRM we've just got a sum um, a sum of money under a provisional sum and the precise nature of the work won't be known until the instruction to expend that provisional sum has been given so there are trigger effects to the giving of the instruction that people sometimes don't um, Fully appreciate but so that it's not all gloomy um, there's perhaps a saving grace in relation to having a provisional sum at all as distinct from a variation that just bounces out of the process and it is at least that if you do have a provisional sum it is a bit of a reminder to the design team to sit down with the employer and establish precisely what it is that is needed so that it can be articulated to the contractor in a timely manner and if you're looking again at JCT whether in the fifth recital or clause 2.11, um, there is the provision for an information release schedule, and that's your opportunity to say to the contractor in relation to the provisional sum for the reception desk, this will be given on date X and it's entered into the information release schedule, which at least signals to the contractor that he can't expect the information any sooner than that date and therefore needs to plan his other operations uh, such that that much is uh, reflected. Yeah, that's a very helpful mechanism, I agree, and it helps to reduce a little bit of the risk of the timing of it but not being appropriate. Thank Absolutely. you, Mark. Absolutely. All right, so now a little lag here. Here we go. Right, so then, um, again, as I say, I reference the codified approach in, in uh, JCT, not, not because I'm promoting JCT as the one and only, but at least it is specific enough that, it, as I say, it does provide a benchmark against which departures and other contracts are, are uh, better understood. Now, for a provisional sum to be regarded as defined, certain information has to be given, and that's all set out in clause 2.9.1.2 of uh, NRM. I must confess I'm reading those clause numbers. They're not uh, there off the top of my head, and we can happily provide uh, to people after this, I'm sure, um, references to the clauses which I'm just speaking to as I, as I go along. Now, I've already explained that NRM2, the New Rules of Measurement second volume, is the successor to SMM7, but SMM7 itself, which many people will be familiar with, also had the same concept of undefined provisional sums and defined provisional sums. So, to, to make um, a provisional sum defines there are certain things that you have to state so you have to state the nature and construction of the work the quantities mm -hmm. indicating the scope and extent of the work where the work is to be fixed and what it what it's going to be fixed to it and also any specific limitations now mm -hmm. a b and c just on the second bullet point they seem straightforward enough I always wonder that if you really can uh, meet the objective of a defined provisional sum and provide that information, you might have been close enough to put in approximate quantities with proper descriptions that might have been a far better basis on which to proceed. But nevertheless, this is the way in which the contract is set up. 
But that then begins to fall down a bit when it comes to any specific limitations, because what I think is a limitation may, may not be what the contractor thinks uh, is a limitation. And it may even be that limitations in due course arise that nobody could have foreseen at the time of defining the provisional sum. So even in good faith, there can be chinks in the um, apparent armour of, of this particular um, approach. Um, now, if we do have a defined provisional sum, this is a very important point. Uh, the contractor is then deemed to have allowed for uh, the work, which is the subject of that provisional sum, and, and have allowed for it in his planning and programming and pricing of preliminaries, such that when you come to, in due course, value the provisional sum, once the scope of the work is known, um, you don't have to consider the planning and programming implications or the pricing of preliminaries because they are already wrapped into the contract sum. Subject, of course, to some caveats I'll come back to because nothing could be that straightforward, could it? Um, now, if the information, going back to the second uh, bullet point there, if the information as part of the defined provisional sum falls short of the requirements set out there, which are called for in NRM, then at that particular point, uh, de facto, the defined provisional sum, even though labelled as such, will then be treated as if it's undefined. So simply labelling a provisional sum uh, as defined and, and hoping to avail of all of the benefits of that won't necessarily um, assist. So what then happens if, if the provisional sum is undefined either because you um, set out for it to be undefined or you stumbled over and your defined became undefined because of the shortcomings in uh, provision of information, then in that sense the contractor then does not allow for the planning or programming or preliminaries implications and therefore it uh, widens um, the ambit of, of, of the points of valuation to be considered, which uh, takes takes me then naturally to uh, the valuing of a of a provisional sum. <clears throat> well, the first things we said about it, it can be spent in whole or in part or not at all. That's a little sort of form of words that people uh, like to quote. Um, but I suppose it can go. Uh, further to say, and you can spend a heck of a lot more than the provisional sum, because basically you will have to pay what is properly due to the contractor for the work uh, performed, which is the subject of the provisional sum. And the provisional sum doesn't create some kind of a, a cap uh, or a limitation, because it is what has been called for um, in, in, in respect of it. Um, <clears throat> so once the instruction is given, um, the provisional sum is automatically one of the early steps is to remove all of the um, provisional sums from the contract sum and then set them up to be expended in whole or in part or not at all or massively over if you're unlucky and then put those sums back into the adjusted final account um, in due course. Now, provisional sums, they're valued just like variations. They're not variations in the sense that the work is already described as an obligation within the contract sum and within the works description. Um, so it's not a variation per se. However, it is valued exactly like a variation. And the relevant rules are in um, clause 5.2.1 of uh, the JCT um, 2016 version, which basically brackets variations and provisional sums for valuation mechanisms, the rules of which you then find in clauses 5.6 to 5.10. Very, very simply, um, slight detour, but relevant, I think. Um, everybody will, will, will know that in valuing a variation, you go through a ladder principle of saying, can I apply um, undiluted the original um, contract rates? If so, you do that. In the event you can't because of a change in the quantity of work or the change of conditions under which the works are being carried out or whatever, then you'll use analogous rates or pro rata rates. Everybody has their own way of describing it. But basically, it's an adaptation of the rate, which still reflects the original uh, pricing assumptions under the job. Um, yeah. Mark, or, those cascade, those cascade, so I was going to say, those cascade principles that you're talking about for valuation in those clauses are, is a common area of argument with employers um, often trying to argue that that machinery doesn't work. So it's very helpful that you're... You're, you're explaining it. Um, well, um, I think it does work, but I, I think um, 
what might not work is making somebody feel happy about the outcome. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure they can come to you about advice on signing a better contract if that is a, a, a problem for them. So um, just on the subject of the ambit um, of, of the valuation, there's quite a lot um, packed into this slide and it might be one um, so we don't get kind of lost in a rabbit hole with it. And people can look at it later. But what I've done is I've, I've looked at the constituent parts of valuing a provisional sum, whether it's defined or undefined. So you can see the parts you're looking at is the work itself, the effect of the work on other work, i.e. other work which is not itself varied, but may be impacted by the work in question. Preliminaries, overheads and profit, extension of time, which is the relevant events, or loss and expense, which is the re relevant matters. And you can see between a defined provisional sum and an undefined, there are ticks and crosses which say whether you have to uh, broach those items um, or not, as the case may be. In the last column of that table, I then put in the, the JCT clauses for anybody who may wish to um, check on them. But there's a, a point to raise actually in relation um, to the overheads and profit, which is that NRM, which is incorporated by reference into JCT 16, does say that the provisional sum does not include the overhead and profit element. And that's always been a debate in the past about whether the contractor somehow could brilliantly foresee, he could predict lottery numbers, he could predict clients' requirements, he could predict everything, and somehow allow for overheads and profit. Now it's saying, no, he doesn't have to predict that. He will price a percentage for overheads and profit that can be applied to the uh, ultimately determined value of the adjustment of the uh, provisional sum. Um, I mean, I, I think that literally risks becoming a, a, uh, a, a topic in its own right, but it's certainly something for um, uh, people to be aware of. Yeah, it's a, it's a common area of argument again. But I don't suppose you can be a smart aleck and just say, well, um, all provisional sums are deemed defined and put those weasel words in and, and uh, expect that to work. Um, well, absolutely, uh, you, you, you would fail. I mean, the, the contract goes so far as to say that if you fall short of that um, earlier slide I, I was showing where we had the uh, the four components uh, of the level of description that, that you provide for a sum to be defined. Uh, you can head it as defined, uh, which is which is a good start, um, but it will only remain uh, properly labelled and treated as such if you have met those tests. But if you've simply, as, as I've seen happen, uh, QSs you know, might see the danger of this and go, oh, well, it's pretty obvious. We'll just say they're all defined and job done. And say, well, no, because the contract uh, then comes to the contractor's rescue in that sense and says, well, no, that that is going to be displaced. I mean, I expect there might be some way of uh, writing some words <coughs> which would cause this to be done uh, and cause it to be successful. I haven't seen it yet. Um, but what I would say is if anybody wants to embark on that exercise, I think their efforts would be far better directed at giving timely and complete design information to the contractor than thinking of ways of tripping them up. So it's all a question of how you um, you know, put your energies in. But actually, Simon, I mean, that, that, that does actually um, raise another point, which is, a, which is an interesting one uh, as well, is that uh, JCT 16 does say that nothing contained in any other co contract documents may override or modify the application of the contract. So therefore, if a quantity surveyor thinks he's being clever by putting in some weasel words within contract bills, then ostensibly it will automatically fall uh, at the first hurdle because the contract will prevail over the BQ. But with one critical exception, JCT says the contract bills are deemed to have been prepared in accordance with NRM2 or such yeah. other method as explained as is explained in the contract bills. And this is a, a one little area where the contract bills can actually trump JCT 16 by yeah. having these sorts of words in. But as I say, um, it's, it is, to me, a waste of energy to think of ways of um, tying a contractor up to the internal design team uncertainty of not knowing what they're asking the contractor to do. Those energies, as I say, should be aimed at the provision of um, timely and uh, complete information. Exactly. Yeah. Find the brief. Yeah. So we then, we then um, come on to the various forms of contract uh, which are out there. I mean, I can deal uh, with the first two um, very quickly indeed before handing over to Lucinda. 
but I've, I've described JCT and its codified nature, uh, which creates certainty of sorts. It may not be a certainty to everybody's liking, but I think certainty is quite a good thing if you can get it. And in a sense, um, other contracts, uh, not FIDIC or NEC, which Lucinda will be covering, but just other contracts which are out there, hybrids or whatever, some of them may incorporate by reference the provisions of JCT and NRM, in which case you have codification. Some may um, set out their own rules, and that would seem a folly because if it's already well described somewhere, why not follow what's already out there and test it? Or it may not say anything at all, at which point you run into all of the um, amazing obstacles and problems that Lucinda described at the outset by reference to the um, cases in question. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So on in the FIDIC world, and I'm talking really about um, FIDIC Redbook as the example here, it does include provisional sums and it does define them as provisional sums set out in the contract, um, which is a little bit circular, but there we go. The guidance in the FIDIC contract says that it's essential to define the scope of each one and record them in a schedule in the contract that should be prepared by the employer which is good advice, but isn't always well followed. And then at clause 13.4, the FIDIC Red Book goes on to say that provisional sums can be instructed, and if they are, then the contract price will be adjusted accordingly. But unlike with JCT, with its links to NRM, which can tell you whether or not you have a defined or undefined provisional sum, FIDIC doesn't include a mechanism like that. So unless it's very, very clear from what's been put in this um, hoped for schedule that goes in the back or through some other mechanism, it may not be easy to tell whether what you're dealing with is an undefined provisional sum or a defined provisional sum, or therefore who exactly is carrying the risk of the time program and preliminaries um, attached to that provisional work. So that's FIDIC. And skipping on to NEC, NEC has an entirely different philosophy to JCT and FIDIC there, in that it doesn't mention provisional sums at all. Its point of view is that if you cannot precisely define aspects of the work, you should not be including them as a provisional sum. So there's quite a difference in philosophy there. Um, so NEC is requiring your provisional sum to be completely in or completely out, but in no sense can you have a provisional sum. There's no in between. Instead, what it does is to manage the um, risk of potentially new or different work through its usual early warning risk register compensation event mechanisms. So either you include the work within um, within the definition of the contract works from the outset and then have to change it through the compensation event mechanism, or it's never there in the first place and you add it in through the compensation event mechanism. So that is quite different to, to everyone else. And some might say it's more straightforward in a sense, um, in that you know you are dealing with something that is there and you you deal with or change or it just isn't there until it's added in, if at all. Yeah, so, more. Yeah. so on that note, and moving on, the next issue that we're going to talk about is this dissatisfaction with the outcome point that Mark mentioned a few minutes ago. Yeah, so kind of question there is, yeah, why have a provisional sum in the first place if, we've got, if you've got all these issues? That is a very good question, Simon, and one I've asked myself several times, I have to say. I think the reality is this is where, you know, it's all very well having a nicely tied up, perfectly documented contract with every piece of information ironed out and got to the bottom of. But in reality, a lot of the time there's pressure to move on and get things done before, um, before you can wait to finalise absolutely everything. So there can be a few reasons, um, commercial reasons, why you just have to get on with it and that can be where provisional sums come into play. So, for example, there may be some pressure to keep the contract sum down and making sums provisional can do that because at the outset you can keep that number lower. Whether or not that can come back and bite you later is a different matter altogether, but certainly at the beginning, if there's pressure to keep the initial price down, having an element of provisionality in that can, um, can allow you to do it. 
Also, there may be um, pressure to complete contracts quickly and move on before there has been an opportunity to bottom out the scope of exactly what this work will be. You know something has to be done, but you don't exactly know what yet or how. Um, but nevertheless, you want to make sure it's part of the programme from the outset or it's thought about in all the progress meetings and all the rest of it. And including it in some way or other through a provisional sum item gives you the possibility to do that. Um, I think historically, some contractors have seen provisional sums as a, as a way of making money and, and adding a bit of profit onto their job. And they've been quite um, quite useful in that sense from a contractor's point of view, perhaps not so much from an employer's. Although you know, some sources suggest that perhaps that doesn't work quite as well as it has done in the past. Um, but I mean, I, being a lawyer, after all, I would always come back to the point that really your contract needs to spell out as much as it possibly can from the outset. And if you are going to be including provisional sums, then you need to be clear about what the mechanism is for making them work and valuing them. Um, and Mark, I'm not sure if you've got anything to add to that. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, basically to agree, agree with all of the observations you've made. I mean, when you say, why have a provisional sum in the first place? It is at least um, an open recognition that you can't communicate properly the design information to the contractor at the time the contract was made. But if you are aware of that and you know it could be trouble brewing if it's not dealt with, then maybe one benefit of it is at least it's there in, in, your, in your consciousness. So if it's a defined provisional sum, you have a certain element of protection, but by no means everything. If you have an undefined provisional sum, then in a sense, you don't have really much protection at all. It's just like an ordinary variation, but at least it's a variation that you know that you have to, though it's not a variation, it's a, the, an instruction for the expenditure of a provisional sum, but at least you are alert to the fact that it's something missing from what the finished article will be, and you can set about designing and articulating to the contractor. So that, that's probably um, a benefit, but, a, but, a, but a, a pretty mild one. And as I was saying earlier, if you do have a defined provisional sum, if you know enough to make it defined within the meaning of JCT and NRM, you are probably close enough to having approximate quantities. So why not have those? In fact, better still, why not just finish the design and uh, measure it um, uh, properly? Which then makes you think, which is the second point here is, well, it, you know, it, it, it is, it's a bad, is a bad situation uh, made worse? Well, um, it might be, um, because if you don't uh, issue instruction in respect to the expenditure of a provisional sum in a timely fashion, even if it is defined, you will still uh, render yourself open to the contractor making claims for extensions of time and loss and expense because of delays or disruption caused, because it's just straight out late release of information. It doesn't matter that it was defined. So. The work which was the subject of the provisional sum might itself be covered in the pricing of the preliminaries, but the effect of the work being put to a later time disrupting the entirety of the work and the programming and, and the progress of the work will still be something that the contractor um, can recover in respect of it. Now, I think very often this comes down to um, whether the provisional sum was set at the right level. I think sometimes people's level of satisfaction or horror at either end of the scale is governed by how the outturn commitment compares to um, the provisional sum. So if we look onto this, so let us have a situation where you think the work itself is going to cost 100,000. You look objectively and a few people have a chat saying, yeah, we know enough about it to think it's worth 100,000. And let's say we're looking at an, at an undefined provisional sum. Straight away, I'm thinking, well, this may not end, end well because other considerations have not been weighed into the balance in setting that level of um, cost revision. Because as we saw earlier under clauses 5.6 to 5.10 of JCT 16, one of the things you consider in the valuation of a variation is the effect of the work being performed in terms of its effect on other work. And then, of course, if it's an undefined provisional sum, the contractor hasn't had to price the preliminaries and the prelims are um, something specifically under the valuation rules that have to be considered in the valuation of a variation. So again, the contractor is entitled to be paid these sums of money, but the person who's put this 100,000 pound provisional sum together hasn't thought of this. 
Um, also, because NRM, as I was mentioning earlier, says that overheads and profit is not included within within the the, um, the provisional sum coverage, it therefore has to be allowed for. NRM says that the contract bill should include a place where the contractor states the overheads and profit percentage that he wants to add to the value of the work performed. So here's another layer going in. And then what if there's prolongation and disruption costs due to the poor timing of the instruction being um, being given. So at this point, the thing that probably objectively was worth £100,000 might have been paid for in that amount if it was designed and nailed down from the outset is now costing £160,000. And the employer may not be very happy about it, but, but the employer should perhaps have been warned earlier of the need for a higher provision because of the particular circumstances of, of producing the work in this way. Now, for those of you who've um, uh, observed these little rings, they'll also see um, it's also the same colours as an archery uh, target, which uh, <laughs> brings, in, brings in the thoughts of some uh, employers disgruntled with the outcome, was saying something that should have been 100,000 is now 160,000. And I think you're being a bit of a robin, a robin Hood in relation to it. But let's go to Friartark, who's always got uh, the last say on these things. I'm saying, no, not at all. It's simply allocating the monies to where they are due, going in with your eyes open, making the proper the proper provisions and not being uh, shocked and surprised uh, when it doesn't work out that way for you. Yeah, I mean, that's um, a very, I mean, that slide, Mark, is a very, in, very valuable, I think, lesson to um, to all of us, I think, just in terms of illustrating the add-ons in relation to certainly, you know, if you're if you're going for a codified JCT with quants situation that's undefined, yes. it's, and that the the impact, as you say, similar with the variations of the effect on non-varied work of that um, of that uh, uh, provisional sum is is often very significant, and again, that goes to timing and everything else. So, yeah, contractors shouldn't be beaten up for getting. Um, some of these points developed because that's the process that comes out of once instruction comes. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then moving back to point four, and I see time marching on, so I can answer this very briefly. It's almost a rhetorical question. So generally, are the consequences of this situation understood and managed? No. <laughs> <laughs> moving on to the next item. <laughs> um, and then you say, well, don't variations cost more um, anyway? And Lucinda was touching on that uh, earlier. Um, I think very often you get these pointless battles and debates about this particular subject where contractors are saying, well, you know, I'm getting X percent over the odds uh, of the bill rate. So it shows what a great uh, deal I struck. Yeah. But actually, if you go back to the slide, as you're showing um, a short while ago, you could say, well, actually, if you build up what are simply layers of entitlement properly set out in the contract and you come up with proper valuation to get to the right answer, not the tactical answer, but the correct answer, you will probably find yourself, even as the professional quantity surveyor um, engaged by the employer, coming up with additions to the um, basic BQ rates, because the basis on which the BQ rates were formulated uh, don't always entirely lend themselves to something which is adapted and late at a different time uh, in, 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 the, um, in, in the program. So the idea that uh, variations cost more isn't really rocket science and I think people just need to accept that you will pay a premium or very likely to at least in the event that you don't nail down all of your requirements uh, from the outset and you certainly shouldn't expect of the contractor that the contractor is better better at guessing um, the employer's ultimate requirements than the employer's own design team so that gets to the end of that yeah, so we have some questions and answers. Uh, we uh, we have some questions. We have, in fact, an enormous amount of questions that were sent to us ahead of this um, of this webinar. So, well, we've got four that I think we could probably accommodate in the time uh, quickly. Um, the first one there regarding the associated preliminaries um, for a provisional sum item. How do you make a fair and reasonable valuation when insufficient information? Mm -hmm. Been provided. You've touched on that briefly, Mark. But do you want to perhaps d deal with that one? Yeah, I, I, th I think it's essentially to, 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 to build up the layers of entitlement, um, not not to add in things which ought not to be there, but very much equally. 
not to neglect things which should be. So if you do look back to my um, archery target point, yeah. you know, ask yourself, what was the work performed? Did it have an impact on other work, which was not varied? That's not to say that you've got to try to contrive that it is, but you ask yourself the question. You consider whether preliminaries um, were to have been priced in respect of the provisional sum, and if they weren't, then you make the proper allowance in respect of it. So in a sense, if there was insufficient information, you could say, well, that's the essence of it, because the provisional sum is, on, is effectively admitting there's insufficient information at the time of its formulation. And ultimately, the work to be valued is the work which is required to be performed without, at that point, being swayed by the amount of the provisional sum. No, that's, yeah. L Lucinda, anything you want to add to that? No, I think Mark has covered that, actually. Very good. Well, what about the next one, Mark? I think it's more more for you, perhaps, that one. Can the contractor claim additional labour costs for unexpected installation difficulties when carrying out the provisional sum works? And obviously that happens quite often. Yeah. Yes. Next. <laughs> yes, he can. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, the very um, key word in that question is unexpected. Yeah. If, if something that nobody could foresee is indispensably required, then that should not serve against the contractor's right of recovery for, for providing the labour plants and materials which are necessary to meet the requirements. So the answer is yes to that question. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of problem permutations that can arise, but I think that's a helpful answer. Um, Lucinda, maybe this one for you. What happens to the contractor's profit if a provisional sum item is omitted from the contract? It's going to depend on on the meaning of omission in, in that context, I think. If the provisional sum work is omitted and given to another contractor, then generally the original contractor will be entitled to its profit on that item as compensation for the fact that the work has wrongly been given to somebody else. Yeah. As I explained earlier, the contractor is entitled to carry out the provisional sum work if it is instructed. Um, and unless there are very clear words in the contract permitting the employer to give work to another contractor, then the contractor is entitled to do that work and to the profit that goes alongside it. Um, if, however, the provisional sum item is not instructed at all and it's just not going to happen, then my understanding is the contractor will not get its profit because the profit the, the work isn't going to be paid for, it's not going to get the work, money for the work at all, so there is nothing to attach any overheads or profit to. Mark, is that what your understanding is as well? Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. So, again, you know, harking back to the um, JCT arrangement, um, in days gone by, a contractor may say if a provisional sum is omitted and not given to somebody else, the contractor can say, well, I foresaw I may be making some contribution to overheads and profit when that sum was expended, and now I have some unabsorbed profit and overhead implications as a result. But that won't now happen with the SBC 16 stroke NRM arrangement because the provisional sum doesn't have a profit and overhead element in relation to it. The NRM rules say you pay the contractor uh, what he's due to be paid, and then you add to it separ this separately stated overheads and profit on it. So you wouldn't have to give back the thing that's not even there in the first place. Yeah, and the, the provisional sum may not be instructed at all, of course, and, and not given to anyone else, which would be perfectly fine yeah. too. Exactly. So that's, that, that's helpful. And then the last one, perhaps a, a quick answer from you both. Um, who's liable for delay caused by the late instruction of a provisional sum? I, again, we've covered it, but I think we've got so many people asking the same question, it's probably worth just... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can take that one. So, it, I mean, I think it's quite useful to look at this in two parts. So, first of all, who bears the risk of the time taken for the provisional sum item to be carried out? And that goes back to this whole discussion around defined or undefined. So, if it's defined, then the contractor is assumed to have taken the, um, the time for that piece of work and factored it into its programme and preliminaries from the outset. So, it's going to take that risk. But the second part of the issue is, well, who bears the risk if the provisional sum work is delayed? So, for example, if the instruction to carry on with that work comes in late from the employer um, or something else interferes with it, then you're into the realms of extension of time and loss and expense provisions in the, in the contract. So a late instruction, for example, might be an act of prevention. So it's likely in the JCT world to qualify as a relevant event. Um, and potentially a relevant matter as well. 
So, I mean, Mark, you mentioned earlier these sort of information release schedules, which can help each party understand when information or instructions need to be issued in order not to delay things. And I think they can be quite a useful tool to manage the risk of late instructions coming through and time and expense arguments arising as a result. Um, they, they certainly can, um, because because they act they act as a reminder to get the information by a certain date. They also <clears throat> rehearse the contractor for not receiving the information sooner than he might otherwise have <clears throat> imagined he could ask for it. So it takes some contention away. Yeah. And even if you issue information later than the IRS says, doesn't automatically lead to extension of time and loss and expense. It only does so to the extent that, as a consequence of that, the information is issued late. So whether we're talking about missing IRS dates, issuing variations, dealing with provisional sums, be they defined or undefined, I think the common point within this question is saying it's a late instruction. The broad mm -hmm. thesis is the contractor is entitled to receive the information at such a time and of such a quality and detail that he is able to meet the completion date. And if he doesn't mm -hmm. receive the information at that rate, it is the employer, not the contractor, who is answerable for the consequences of that. Sure. Yeah. So causation is obviously important in terms of actually, actually what happened. But yeah, I can see exactly what you're saying. Uh, we've got one final question, actually, going back to item three, and this will be the very last point is how does this apply in civil code legislation? So that's the question about what happens to the contractor's profit if a provisional sum item is omitted. Um, I would say it probably is similar to the English law position, but you've possibly got good faith and other arguments coming in. But, but Mark, do you want to deal with that one very quickly? Yeah, I, I, th I think if if the provisional sum was in no way um, described, defined or codified, it's just somebody had a provisional sum. I think, and it, and it were also a significant provisional sum, I think the contractor could begin to get a, 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 an argument up and running that he reasonably assumed that would be expended and that he would recover some overheads and profit in relation to the performance of that work. Yeah. Such that... Um, let's say they thought they were going to make 100,000 overheads and profit, but they, they had 50,000 of general running costs in there and 50,000 because of the variation. They could say, well, I'm down 50,000. Um, I wouldn't say it would be a slam dunk, far from it, but, but you, could, you could get the argument uh, moving in a way uh, that you wouldn't in the same circumstances under a JCT stroke NRM arrangement. Yeah, yeah, depending on the circumstances, yeah. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that, uh, Lucinda? No, not on that one. I think you've covered it. Thank you. Well, thank, I, I want to thank you in the uh, customary way. It would be clapping, but we don't do that on webinars. Um, but I'm, I'm sure met metaphorically we do. Uh, so thank you both very much for, for, for that whistle stop tour. We've spent 50 minutes on it and I know we could spend probably a good a good further hour. So, so, so I'd like to thank all of those that have been able to join for doing so. You'll be able to uh, download this at a later date, watch it as you go jogging uh, in your evenings uh, and uh, want to absorb slightly more information or recap on things. And um, until next time, you'll have a slide in a minute in relation to our BIM seminar webinar, which is our next one on the digital transformation world going on in construction uh, with Jeremy uh, Glover and Dr. Stacey Sinclair and Mark Pantry presenting. So um, thank you all very much and uh, we'll say goodbye. Thank you.